Greetings everybody and welcome to the Mobile IT Community of Interest, our monthly meeting for January. Thank you very much for joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to review how to use the GoToWebinar system um, in order to optimize your experience today. Um, I'll explain briefly how you can interact during the community uh, sessions using the GoToWebinar system. You've all been put on the uh, default mute settings due to lots of participants on the call. Please use the orange arrow uh, to show or hide the control panel as you see fit. You could change this setting on the view menu at the top of the panel. Um, you're encouraged to please forward any questions that come up using the questions tab at the end. Your questions will be read uh, after the featured presentation and we will identify who is asking the question in order to foster fuller participation and interaction between attendees. If you'd like to remain anonymous, please let me know. We'll also have at the end of the session some live polls which you'll be able to answer from your screen by clicking on the choices provided. Um, I will follow up and let everybody see what the results are during the session. Um, we will also have at the end of the meeting a follow-up survey. If you can, please respond to these questions so we can incorporate your feedback into the ongoing work of the community. So I will now start the presentation. I am Stuart Young. I represent Fiatec in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, on behalf of all of us at Fiatec, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the latest in the Mobile IT Community of Interest monthly meetings. Today's presenter is Fran Raybuck. A lot of you will know Fran. Fran will present a collection of ideas for future mobile research projects. Before we get into the presentation, I'd like to take a minute to introduce Fiatech and this community of interest to those who are not members of Fiatech and are new to this, um, and, and hopefully participants in the future. Fiatech is a member-based organization with an objective of improving the productivity of, capital, of the capital projects industry through the deployment of technology. We have nearly 100 member organizations, partners, including academia and subject matter expertise and companies and we welcome new members to participate in all of our activities. Our goal is to lead global development and adoption of innovative practices through the in integrative and uh, work view uh, of construction. Ultimately, we strive to enable participants to advance industry. If you're in interested in joining in any of these activities or would like more information, please drop me an email uh, at young at fiatech.org. Regarding mobility in particular, contractors in the industry have observed uh, improved project performance through collaboration, uh, productivity uh, and cost given increments it, uh, using uh, information mobility. These improvements are achieved through um, improvements in practical aspects of field work such as less reliance on plans and specifications, uh, reduced risk, um, reduced transactions, distributing inspection tasks and shorter project schedules. In Fiatech, we strive to solve technical problems, practical problems, and the challenges associated to implementing mobile technologies, which are of a practical nature. Mobile technology has already clearly enhanced project performance with a lot of uh, EPCs around the world, but there is still much space and need for improvement to continue. As such, many opportunities in the industry um, are there to attain more effective project outcomes through information mobility. About the community of interest, um, at the core of Fiatex interest, we are creating this mobile community of interest. Uh, we as a community hope to realize these potentials and with your help we can make a real difference to this industry and increase productivity. The objective of, of the community of interest is to bring together project stakeholders, ideas to improve efficiency through the use of mobile IT and share the knowledge to implement those ideas in the industry. Participants in this community get together in two ways. Firstly, through monthly meetings, such as this one, where all participants come together to learn about specific applications and technologies. Second, participants get together through virtual discussions which focus on specific topics of interest to the community and in which participants discuss their current approaches to mobility in order to advance <clears throat> the knowledge on implementation of mobile systems. Some of these discussions happen uh, live during Fiatech events. 
The deliverables from the community include reports and may include pilot tests or use cases as the work of the community is expanded. These deliverables can give insight into the benefits, challenges and costs involved in, in the use of new technologies and applications. Furthermore, the work inside the community can become FIATEC-wide projects through formal project proposals. This would increase the scale of a given project and involve all FIATEC membership. The community, I should say, is a joint effort between FIATEC and COMET. COMET is a UK-based organisation whose principal aim is to learn from experience and deliver measurable business benefit in terms of adoption of mobile technologies. As such, this partnership supports the work and objectives of the community. Now, we'll move on to the main presentation. As I've already mentioned, we've got Fran Raybuck, who will present a roadmap on suggested future mobile research projects. Fran is a technology research analyst with a 30-year career of contributions to the industry as a consultant, thought leader, and internationally recognized expert in emerging technologies in mobile wireless, Internet of Things, robotics, 3D printing, data analytics and visualization, together with social media, collaboration and sustainability. He is a frequent speaker and writer, advisor and judge at major technology industry events. In 2006, he was awarded the first ever Fiatech Star Award in recognition for his contribution to the industry. Fran is a member of the Global Advisory Council for the World Future Society and one of the 100 plus experts driving future predictions through forecasting and with techcastglobal.org. He also works for a variety of organizations on strategic planning and execution of special high tech projects. Currently, he is the conference chairman for the launch of the Robo Universe Conference and is working on the planning agenda workshops and speaker recruitment for this three day trade show and conference. Okay, Fran, I'll pass it over to you now. Okay, I'm ready. Don't fumble this. <laughs> <laughs> All yours. Great. Okay, I'm going to just show my screen here. Bring it up. Okay, uh, do you see me there? Not yet. Now we do. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to uh, do another webcast here. Uh, uh, it seems like it was only yesterday where uh, we were doing toys for techies. Well, uh, as promised, I uh, got a chance to go out to see Yes and see many of the great toys there. And uh, I'm going to go through some of the things that I think are interesting and important in. I think your planning process overall, not only for your organization, but potentially for really working together with Fiatech to create projects to better understand, I think, a lot of the issues I'm going to talk about and a lot of the new technologies and things. So with that, let's get started. Uh, I'm not going to go down the list there, but there is the list of the mobile landscape. We're going to talk about BYOD, user interfaces, visualization, location, wireless charging, and end up with drones and robotics. Okay, I'm waiting for my screen change here. There we go. Anyway, as uh, as part of the World Future Society and Futurist, uh, I think one of my favorite quotes is. Uh, actually goes to Abraham Lincoln. Several other people have been uh, noted for, for quoting it or saying it, but uh, I think he's probably the original source, and I think it's a great saying. And Many people are interested in trying to understand what's coming and create strategic planning, but really, I think the best way to really predict your future is, is to really create it and work at going towards a goal and driving towards uh, what you want to do with your organization and with the technology in, in your uh, organization. So let's talk with the mobile landscape. You know, who's winning the race? Everybody wants to know, uh, you know, what the market shares are, uh, what's happening. Who, you know, is Apple going to continue to be the leader? 
Um, I think this year was significant with the uh, I6 release, and uh, it's really created uh, almost three three tiers of devices: the phone, which is very small handheld, the tablet, and then something called the phablet, which is sort of a uh, somewhere between the phone and the tablet. It can be the mini tablet, they're the mini pad type thing. And typically I describe those things as being uh, you know, under nine inches. And then the, uh, the sort of supersized phone or the phablet. Um, and, and these middle tiers, I think, are, are finding uh, more usefulness, I think, in construction because it gives you just enough real estate. Uh, it's it's really interesting to hear this and, and see this come through because Jobs was a was adamantly against doing anything smaller than the tablet and uh, and the phone nothing in between like a mini tablet or or a large phone. Uh, I'll talk about some of the future features of phones that you'll start to see uh, coming this year, and uh, really in a lot of ways. And I, I looked at the survey of what people were interested in. Uh, the phone is going to become the front and centerpiece for almost everything you're going to be doing, uh, either on a personal basis or on the job site, and really become the controlling device for this whole IoT, Internet of Things movement. Okay, so anyway, here is the market share, and you can see that uh, you know, over the last couple of years, certainly Android is, a, a, as an operating system, uh, is growing uh, tremendously. In fact, it's it's almost like a, a three to one ratio to the Apple. Uh, BlackBerry has become almost insignificant. Many of the other platforms are, are basically going away. Uh, Microsoft is uh, seeing some glimmer of hope, uh, and one of the things that they're doing that's different than, is that. Uh, uh, they're going after the low end of the market. I think that's going to be a trend you're going to begin to see, not just the high-end smartphone, uh, and especially at the price point of a couple hundred dollars or six hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars, but you're going to see smartphones that are under a hundred dollars, and that market begin to uh, grow very quickly, especially uh, if you look over in uh, China and other markets where you have uh, first adopters getting phones. Uh, so Microsoft has some glimmer there. Actually, the leading player is Samsung. I mean, leading player, single player, is Apple and Samsung, which is in the Android uh, box. There is probably second. So what are we going to see in phones or on tablets or going forward this year? Uh, obviously, the processing speeds are going to continue to go up. In fact, you know they're they're now approaching speeds that uh, only a uh, a year or so ago were, were the processing speeds of uh, desktop systems. And desktop systems and laptop systems are becoming uh, not obsolete, but uh, I think you, you'll start to see these detachable laptops. Uh, Microsoft has been doing that, and a couple of the Android people. Uh, Apple isn't in that game. Uh, they, they sell their their Mac laptops, but I, I think going forward you're going to see this model that's going to merge operating systems and create a detachable device, that, a screen that could become a tablet or become get attached with a keyboard. Uh, so the speed in the processors also allows you to do a lot more on the screen, a lot more graphics, uh, things that uh, in the early iPads you weren't able to do, you'll suddenly be able to start to consider doing in graphics modes and CAD systems and things like that. Uh, the other big thing is the cameras. The cameras are going to improve tremendously. Uh, Microsoft is fairly ahead of the market in this and that they came out with their uh, 40, uh, 40 megapixel type uh, camera first, which is you know amazing number of uh, pixels there. But uh, the other trend will be multiple cameras, I think. You're going to see multiple cameras being put into devices for measuring things and for 3D, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Charging. Um, uh, we're entering an era, and I'll talk more about the charging standards that are coming, but uh, uh, in another year or two, I think, we'll, uh, at least I hope, we'll all start to be able to unplug our phones and not have to be tethered by a cable and find a plug somewhere, but we'll be charging off of 
wireless charging stations, and they'll become widely available. Uh, and I think they're important and can be, have an impact in the construction space. Uh, open hardware. Uh, Google is sort of leading the pack here, and it's a little bit experimental. We'll see how it works. But the idea that you pick and choose and add your components to your phone. Uh, if you want a higher resolution screen, you pop out a screen and you put in a new screen. If you want more uh, location-based technology, better GPS stuff, and in addition to GPS, you can add uh, potentially maybe a chip that does Galileo and, and the other uh, location-based uh, services. Uh, but we'll see how that works. I expect that the first releases of that will be coming this year. Uh, Bluetooth energy is probably a little bit old news, but I think going forward you're going to see more and more, and actually uh, this is where Android was a bit behind, even though they had the Bluetooth energy and the standards there, uh, they weren't as mature, I think, as Apple. Apple seemed to work much better, uh, and even in development environments, but I think that uh, that has changed in uh, the Android uh, devices that are coming out now are catching up there. And last but not least, keyboards. Either keyboards that uh, attach and detach as covers or other models where the keyboard can appear, uh, but physical things or, or other models of keyboards as people become more and more dependent in using uh, the devices. <coughs> so one of the phrases that you've heard probably over the last couple of years is the, the BYOD, bring your own device, and companies trying to manage uh, their services there uh, uh, and creating a, sort of an open choice movement. Uh, it, some organizations have addressed it, some haven't. Uh, some have taken other approaches and uh, purchased uh, single devices and required certain devices. But anyway, uh, if you're not on board there or not at least considering software in that area, you better look out, because what's next is workers bring their own other things. Uh, bring your own X, I call it. What are those X things? Wearables, watches, uh, prescription Google Glasses. Now, recently, Google just announced that they canceled their, their glass project. But I think that will continue. And I've actually seen prescription glasses that have it embedded and become almost... Uh, imperceptible as, as being a, uh, a computing device of some type. You'll see people bringing health and fitness things onto the site. Potential uh, video cams that they wear around their neck that uh, you know is now coming up in the police, but maybe they'll wear it on site uh, uh, so that they can sort of record actions on site or whatever. Uh, they may be bringing their own robots. It sounds a little bit crazy, but you'll you'll see later where there's a wearable drone that has come out. And, uh, I can see people who bring their toolboxes in that toolbox have something that uh, is robotic in some way. Uh, but the bottom line is that the evolution of this management of devices, which the device was always just your your phone or your your mobile devices, is going to move beyond that, and you're going to be managing and bring your own things uh, and you'll be managing things on the site uh, with this software going forward. Uh, and if you're not quite sure, don't think that's a, a realistic uh, projection, just, just think of all the things that uh, IT has traditionally controlled at the uh, laptop and desktop level and if those things are going away and the phone is becoming the predominant device, and then the next step in that evolution, of course, is, is lots of other small, smart things being embedded everywhere on the site. I think you can begin to see that you're, you're going to need something to manage all that infrastructure. And if you don't pay attention, then that ball and chain is going to come down and it'll be a wrecking ball on your, your whole organization. Uh, user interfaces, because of the, uh, the advancements in the processing power and because people are looking to uh, have smarter and quicker and more friendly user interfaces, uh, we're going to be moving beyond the keyboard and mouse more and more. Uh, some of this started with, uh, I guess, you know, the Windows 8 and touch screens and things like that. But I think touch will yield to gesture 
I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the computing will change with these new interfaces because you have more processing power. Uh, the device will start to become more intelligent and move with you and understand they have eye tracking devices. Uh, and it will start to anticipate your next move. It will remember that after you check your mail, typically the next thing you do is a task is go onto your Twitter account and it will start to stack those things up and anticipate your next moves and move, move you more quickly in a united fashion across a series of processes. And you'll get better screen design, new different types of screen design. The best example of that is the Note 4. Uh, this is the Samsung Note 4 Edge, they call it, and it may not be very clear in this image here, but uh, the screen actually curves over the edge, and the icons are on the edge, and you may say, well, why am I doing that? Well, as the phones get bigger, uh, when they were smaller, we were able to hold them single-handedly and reach across the screen and tap things with our thumb. As they get bigger, we're not, it's not as easy to do that. So by having that on the side, it makes it easier to do navigations. Uh, and it's just one model that you may see coming out. I'm not saying every, every device is going to have screens, but you'll see some experimentation. I've actually seen cases that go on the iPhone that make the whole case or the whole outer uh, perimeter of the device uh, uh, touch and you could have it set up so if you touch the top corner it opens your calendar, if you touch the bottom corner it opens something else. Uh, I think you'll see models like that that will try to continue to improve your the acceleration of the application of your tasks. Uh, one of the things in doing development, uh, and I've worked with some companies on this, is, is the whole idea is before you get started, uh, doing some mobile mock-ups, and anybody can do this. There's lots of great tools out there that I highly encourage uh, organizations to get involved with. I've done some uh, workshops on this here in the past. But the whole idea is that uh, roughly, depending on uh, the application and complexity and things like that, about 20 to 30 percent of the development time for an application is wrapped up in the design. Uh, if you make the mistake of just sort of throwing rough uh, descriptions and specs over the wall to the developer and you leave the developer to go off and, and uh, create the design, especially if they're doing multiple devices, uh, you run the risk of going back and forth so through several iterations of saying, no, move this pixel to the left or to the right or change this screen. That's where these mock-ups become in because you can create a realistic looking mock-up. Uh, now, there's, there's multiple ways to do this. Uh, in its simplest form, using paper and using uh, UI stencils. And you don't even have to have the exact shapes. You can draw boxes and things like that. And then uh, the tools allow you to take the paper-based thing and with a camera take a, a snapshot of it and then take that image and connect multiple series of images and mark hot spots and link them together. So in effect, you can almost build a, an application off of paper and, and with your phone with some, some tools um, to, to look and act the way you want something to act and navigate. Um, and, and, you know, creating that interface is, is a tough job, so don't, don't underestimate that. Uh, there's even paper models and, and tools for doing uh, designs on watches, for doing designs on uh, glass and wearables and things like that. Uh, here's one of the applications called ProtoSketch. Basically, you, you draw your stuff, then you take pictures of each of your screenshots, and then you highlight areas and interactively create a prototype. So if I touch this square or I touch this icon that I drew, it's going to take me here to another screen and basically you can develop the whole flow of an application that way. Uh, another tool that's really useful, uh, if you're a real PowerPoint fan, uh, is Kinotopia. And this helps not only in the prototyping phase, but since it's pixel perfect, you can take a lot of the design elements and then use them and give, turn those over to the developer, and he can use those elements in the, the final application, building the final application there. But uh, they have a great set of tools with all of the latest, uh, you know, if you're 
building an iOS 8 application, it's different than uh, in some u user interface things in iOS 7. If you're doing an Android, buttons and things look differently. So they faithfully produce those things, and they also use, uh, you know, they, they have templates also for other devices like uh, uh, the Microsoft phone and stuff like that. So how do you build a mobile app? There's, there's really sort of three approaches, and how you do it uh, depends. The middle one there is the pure OS toolkit. You just really hunker down, and you use, you know, the iOS Apple tools, and you build it, and you, you have, you know, an expert coder that does everything, and, and you uh, use uh, one of the Java engines for Android, uh, uh, or for Microsoft, you're going to use, you know, the, the .NET toolkit. Uh, but that's the hardest. It requires a lot of details, a lot of work. Uh, it usually results in the most efficient uh, tool, but it also requires the most effort and uh, can take the most time. And especially if you're going through early, many iterations and stuff like that, it can become tedious. Uh, one of the approaches, especially since we're getting higher speeds on the devices and we're also getting uh, more processing power, is a pure internet approach, designing internet screens that will resize and uh, fit for different size screens, and that allows you to make it cross-platform. Uh, generally, this, this is called responsive design movement, and it's meant to be uh, sort of adaptable to different operating systems, different browsers, etc. And then there's a the middle ground. The middle ground basically it, there's there's two two ways. One is sort of a shell that's native based, and it's driven by user design that puts things into the shell. So the idea is, you use one of these tools and allows you to very graphically build an application, uh, and then it takes that and converts it, and it runs off of its shell. Um, and allows you to run the application that way. The other is a transformation tool so that actually converts a design and converts it into native operating system code, and then you compile that code there. So those are two approaches. There are a ton of tools there, and uh, I pulled up some of these here. By the way, before you even start to do the work on the mobile device, you really want to do uh, you know, uh, an understanding and get together what APIs do I want to access, what things and what tools. And more and more applications are going to be built in this building block fashion where you're building APIs and you're not just building applications. Uh, or, and the applications are being built off of the APIs. It accelerates the whole processing there. Uh, and you see various approaches here. Uh, you probably can't read them all, but uh, you know, the, the IBM and SAP and Kony, and there's, there's multiple ones like that that are moving ahead. Uh, I can do a whole session on this, but uh, just be aware of the, the tools. Microsoft's really uh, starting to push uh, Xamarin, by the way, uh, as a cross-platform development tool that works under .NET. So, uh, many people have seen some of the things done with Connect, and I've talked about Leap before. Uh, and more recently, you might have seen the commercials for the Intel RealSense, where somebody is doing gestures and pushing and pulling into the screen and doing just waves of their hand to do things and move things around. And uh, you can see the relative size of this device, uh, and it's going to go into not just laptops or desktop add-ons, but it's going to go into uh, Android pads and other devices going forward. Uh, I think this will grow to become almost a standard component over the next two years. Uh, I don't see any other real competition coming for it. The masses will be adapting, and, and uh, Intel's been pushing it. They actually announced it and, sh and were showing it uh, last year at CES, but it seems like it's almost been a whole year until they're getting ready to really launch it in a full sense. Uh, the other thing is changing is applications We've, we've become very accustomed, in fact, I find myself doing more and more things by just saying it into uh, my Google uh, or uh, your Surrey. And uh, I think, you know, the next question is, well, how can I build my own custom applications for speech applications? Uh, and it's important to understand the steps uh, without going into all the details here. Uh, 
uh, understand that a speech application, the anatomy of it is, is almost like five pieces. First of all, it's just understanding the words. What did you say? What were the words? Once it understands the words, and by the way, that's a fairly easy problem now. It's fairly accurate, the engines. And most of that isn't happening on your phone. Most of that is actually happening on the server. It passes your sound or your voice to the server, and the, uh, the information comes back. Some things that are operating locally on the device when you're not connected uh, are translated, but generally it's not as good as when it's going back to the server. Once I have all the words, I need to get a better understanding of the meaning of the words. Then once I know what you want, then I have to answer the question, and that's where all the knowledge engines come in. Uh, you know, Apple actually uses uh, Wolfram Alpha and travel databases and other knowledge engines. And finally, it comes back and converts that answer, which is in text, to a speech output, which, which is fairly easy. And really, the next generation is multimodal uh, interfaces, where I can say and do a gesture of some type, move these things from here to there, and do a gesture on the screen. Uh, the other big thing you'll see, uh, and you're seeing more and more of this, but I think you'll see see it being used and should be used on the uh, on the work site. Uh, in the past, I know a lot of people have done research on digital displays and putting them on the work site. Uh, I think it's really going to explode. First of all, if you did any shopping uh, for TVs during the holidays, you're probably amazed, amazed as I was to see large screen TVs going for a couple hundred dollars. It just seemed unplausible to think that prices would drop that much. But that will continue, and you'll see more and bigger displays, and they become more and more important. In fact, one of the things Intel is doing, it's creating an Intel thumb drive computer that will be like a uh, like a, a Amazon Fire or a Google thing, but you plug it in the back, and it has computing power in it and converts your TV or screen into a basic computer device. Uh, nothing's more sort of uh, <laughs> obvious than what Google has done in this area, where in New York City, they have the largest display, a 25,000 square foot display with 24 million pixels, massive, massive billboard. And, and that's just you know the extreme. We're going to have everything like that and that size down to even using iPads and reusing iPads as sort of uh, little touch screen interfaces uh, on the job to sign in or something like that. But really start to look at how you can leverage displays uh, on the site to disseminate information and create the information points and things like that. Uh, I'm going to next talk about visualization and, and uh, you know it's it's a hot topic but in what I call next-gen visualization is is the capture. Uh, most of the show and tell and talk on visualization has been computer generated, showing something in sort of a, a navigator 3D movement type phase. But that's the artificial world. That's generally generated from the uh, uh, from the computer software, from the CAD software. But the bigger question is, how do I capture 3D? How do I capture virtual reality, 360, panoramas, et cetera? And then the next big question is, how do you store it? There isn't really a one standard interface, and uh, hopefully that changes over the next year or so. And also, how do you mix and translate these? If I start to take uh, images, full 3D images, and scan something. Uh, you know, can I convert it from a screen 3D view of something to a physical 3D format that I can use on a 3D printer? Uh, here I am at CES, actually uh, using the uh, Samsung uh, with some of my friends. Uh, Pavarotti there was was interested in trying it out. He seems pretty excited. And then uh, in one of the stores there, uh, I had to help a mannequin sort of get some direction to uh, to get out to uh, the Las Vegas Boulevard there. Just added those there. But when you we have 3D image environments, generally you have a uh, we're adding a uh, uh, almost like a blanket of shell over top of the uh, the wire frame itself, uh, and it is it is a combination of using point clouds and things like that. But more important is, you know, when we start to add realistic images, and here's almost how we're going to be looking at capturing images. Panorama has been around for a long time, even when we first started getting digital and even pre-digital. 
we had cameras that would take panorama shots, or we had software that would stitch multiple images into a fairly good panorama. Uh, that's not new. What's new is when the panorama doesn't just go wide, it goes all the way around. It becomes a 360 degree wide angle wraparound. Uh, now you have to sort of uh, distort the, the flat image of it, and that's why this sort of looks distorted here, but if I was looking at this on a, uh, on a VR type headset or something, I'd be able to see almost a straight boardwalk in front of me uh, by turning left and right. And to add to that, uh, in addition to just wrapping 360, I do a spherical, and that means I look at the top and bottom of whatever I'm doing. So th that makes it even more. Now, I'm going to extend the panorama even beyond that. I'm going to add 3D. So to do 3D, I need a left and right vision. So I'm going to take my 360 spherical panorama, panorama and multiply it by 2. Then I'm going to add video in all those directions, up, above, et cetera, and then I'm going to allow movement in all those directions with the video. You can begin to see that just a few frames of this stuff can be very, very data intensive, number one, and very complex, but also very useful because now you have, uh, you've converted an actual environment or created a virtual environment that is very immersive. Uh, and the, the trick really isn't just the software and the CAD stuff that's out there, but it really is capturing all this visual information. The only way to do that is to have devices like this Panoball, and there's multiple companies out there now that are creating uh, multiple, multiple camera systems that will create automatic panoramas with video. Um, going beyond that, let's talk, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second later when I talk about some of the drones a bit too. Uh, let's talk about location. Uh, first of all, hardware is finally catching up with the software. There's been so many algorithms out there on trying to do indoor location. Uh, no, I'm not talking GPS stuff here. I'm talking about things where I don't have GPS, but trying to locate items. Uh, lots of things in RFID, but we're finally seeing low energy Bluetooth thing come out. Uh, now that Apple has put NFC into their device, uh, it's moving ahead. And uh, we have uh, the Gimbal product that is a spin-off from Qualcomm, which I highly recommend. In fact, they just uh, announced a partnership with Shazam. Um, wireless charging. Wireless charging is going to become important. Uh, and there's actually two standards. One is the QI, or they call it, it's pronounced Qi, and the other is Rezence, R-E-Z-E-N-C-E, -E, or A4WP. Both of these work on a conductive uh, basis, almost a magnetic, creating a magnetic field. Uh, I think the wireless power consortium or the Qi standard will become the predominant thing that we'll use on single devices. Um, there's some debate. You have many people on both sides of this debate here, but uh, I would really be looking for your own personal devices and charging. Uh, and you can get cases to go over your current phones that do this uh, to do wireless charging. Uh, the resonance, I think, will have a broader effect because resonance is built as a standard to not just be a one-to-one -one device charging, but almost to be a wide area. So think of a tabletop that I'd be able to put multiple, just put down a tablet, put down my laptop, put down my phone, and charge all those things. Or pull my car up and do a fast charge uh, as opposed to you know putting these artificial things into these pseudo-electric gas tanks that we have. Um, and Qualcomm has some stuff uh, to do that. So you're going to see this wireless charging. Uh, effectively, I mean, the real dream is to be able to walk into a room and charge everything that you have automatically. Uh, so one of the things I'm suggesting is that you really want to consider this for the construction site. last thing you need is people plugging in their phones with extension cables and things running around. Uh, there are devices, I've seen them in many, many conferences, and you might want to consider this for Fiatech, maybe get somebody to sponsor at these lockbox charging stations for the devices that you're using and also the personal devices. Uh, you know, I think cables today are going to all be going wireless tomorrow. Uh, I got a few minutes here. I'm going to talk about drones. So much has changed since the first time I showed the, uh, the AR drone. And uh, you know, there's there's still a lot of legal tanglements there, but I think that you almost cannot afford to ignore them now. And there's so much happening there. Uh, 
the number of jobs that are coming out is really amazing in the size of the market. Facebook, Amazon, Google are looking to extend their wireless, but they're looking to create sort of a wireless cloud above things. Uh, Google is actually launching balloons and trying to create a wireless network. Uh, they're using it for wind energy, driving energy in uh, for windmills and capturing it, moving the energy along. Uh, there's over 100 applications, commercial applications, of the use of drones, and job titles and all are coming, the certification. At CES, one of the big things was what I'll call all the uh, follow me selfies, multiple drones that are all chasing this, and the idea is you, what do you get when you mix sort of a GoPro camera with a drone, and you get this flying thing that follows you and captures your action. Now, I may just want it to follow me as I audit uh, uh, construction site. Uh, the Nixie was uh, actually the winner. It's a wearable drone. It wraps around your wrist and then you unwrap it and it flies and has a camera on it. The Hexo, you can't see the size of that thing, but all these things are becoming something that you can literally put in your toolbox and pull out at any time. Uh, and then the uh, the Air Dog, which is the top one there, actually won the best of show. It, its wings and all fold up and becomes very compact. Large opportunity here, $13.6 new billion dollars in investment for, for jobs and staff, 70,000 new jobs, and creating a whole new economy of, uh, you know, at the $82 billion level. One of the most interesting things, and this will be my last uh, points here, but uh, I can talk a lot about robotics, but the most important thing I think I saw there was the Voxel 8, which is a 3D printer that is also crossing into the robotics area. Uh, and the idea is here, I can use that printer and print electrical and physical designs there. Uh, part of it is being driven by Autodesk, and you really want to look at what they're doing with their Spark partners, they're calling a Project Wire, it's software that you design the physical and the electronics of, a, of something, of, and uh, some of these partners, HP with their 3D printer, Occipital has their uh, camera system. Uh, emerging objects is actually for architecture. Uh, so all these companies are now becoming partners with Autodesk and their, their Spark partners to really jumpstart. This, this is the next big thing that's going to be happening in design and 3D printing over the next year. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, I'm the conference chair now organizing the Robo Universe conference in uh, New York uh, uh, on May 11th to 13th, and we also have follow-up ones later in uh, Korea and uh, San Diego. So uh, hopefully uh, people will check out the page. Uh, we're recruiting the speakers now, and hope to see some of you there. If you're interested in more information, please contact me, and I'll, I'll talk to you about it. So that wraps it up. Uh, I think I'm a little over there. Do uh, you want to take over here now and ask some questions, Stuart? Stuart, do you uh, have audio control there? Yes, I can. I can hear now, Fran. Okay, and I can talk too. So uh, as we answer questions, we yeah. can I'm just going to pull the poll questions up first. Um, okay. okay. So the first, the f I've gone forwards. Sorry, I've gone forwards. Okay. First poll question is this one: Do you have a BYOD plan? You should be seeing that on your screen now. I feel like we need some Jeopardy music in the background here. <laughs> well, you can provide that. <laughs> Do you have any ready? <laughs> no, I don't have any ready, and you don't want me to hum. Okay, then. I'll just give it a few more seconds there, but it looks like um, we've got a good portion of voted. Any more votes?
yeah we've got, uh, we've got a fair portion of uh, vote to cast there okay I'll close that one and I'll share that hopefully everybody can see that it's interesting it's, it's fairly divided uh, uh, I'm not surprised I think this is very typical in the industry there's large not a large but about a third uh, that have done something or, or in the evaluations and some that that really are, are, are not doing anything with it yeah and uh, and there are some those we don't support personal devices or and those that don't know the answer is probably no for them because they're, they're not being being uh, tagged or, or set up to use it so uh, there's there's about 30 percent there about a third that haven't it may be interesting if there is an interest to uh, coordinate the uh, the efforts of people that are evaluating or do have it, and uh, you know maybe put something together to publish what they like, what they don't like, and features in their selection process and all. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that, everybody, for voting. I'll just um, I'll move on to the next one. Um, what projects would you be interested in supporting within Fiatech? What's the next? question. I hope everybody can see that one. I'll have one of each. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all little tasty projects. Nothing on the top one though. Interesting. I'll just give that a couple of seconds more. Okay, we'll close that one out and launch the result. Well, that doesn't surprise me because a good many are either uh, have BYOD or uh, are well into the analysis there. So uh, if nothing else, there's probably more givers than takers there. So that might help people that haven't done anything. Sure. sure. Uh, the rest is pretty even. It seems like everybody's really into uh, visualization, yeah. uh, the camera and 3D captures and visualizations of actual sites yeah, yeah that doesn't surprise me either mm -hmm. yeah good well thanks everybody for that one um, let's move on to the next one what mobile form is best suited for on-site construction applications in your opinion full tablets mini tablets phablets phones does size matter? <laughs> uh huh. I'm sure I'm not going to influence anybody, but I'm going to take a guess that well over uh, over 60% are going to be in those two middle ones well the full the full tablet units are just pushing at the moment and the minis are coming in a quick second yeah let me uh, share that one can you see that Wow, uh, I'm surprised. I'm surprised the full tablets have gotten as large. I thought there was generally a drifting towards. So in the phablets and mini tablets, you have, uh, and and the answer may be it depends on the application. Obviously, you know, in some applications, just having your phone, you don't want, want even a mini tablet. It's too big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think. Yeah, interesting results. Well, thanks everybody for that one. We'll hide that one up, and we'll bring out the uh, the last one. What mobile operating system platforms do you support?
we we can't have sort of open comments here, but I'd be interested if this has changed in the last year or it's it's been pretty steady as far as whatever they're selecting now. Yeah, it's running about 38% at the moment with almost everything um, and a split across the rest, which mm. is interesting. Just give that a few more seconds. Thank you. By the way, I do see some, as I said earlier, some uptick in the Microsoft platforms this coming year. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't surprise me either. I thought there might be a little bit larger a mix of Apple and Android. Um, <laughs> almost everything. Uh, <laughs> If you add the almost everything in Apple and Android, I mean, you have two thirds. So it seems like uh, everybody's doing almost almost any platform, which which is really a good sign. I mean, we're moving towards much more open platforms, and it also means that in your organization, it can get really expensive to to try and develop things under multiple platforms. So you really have to start to see how that's that should or shouldn't influence your selection of development tools. Uh -huh. Well, thanks everybody for, for voting on the poll questions there. I'll just move on to the, um, the questions and answers panel now. Um, there's quite a few of you put some qu put questions in, so I'll, I'll read through those. Um, okay, the, the first question comes in from Nicholas Holst. Uh, when will this include considerations about the construction industry, is asked. Fran? Uh, I'm not sure I understand exactly. Considerations? You mean the topics that I covered, I think, are all applicable to yeah. the construction I, industry? I can't go back to Nicholas. He's, he's, not, he's no longer on the call. But um, Okay. I, can... I mean, uh, I didn't, didn't really drill down into applications related to uh, visualization. I think most people, in fact, they suggest select a lot of things there. If people are questioning, okay, how can I use a drone or how can I use a robot on site? Uh, you know, I have many examples of that and we can, we can follow up later with and drill down more deeply into applications related there. Or it becomes something that, you know, you look at doing as a project to write up to say, okay, how can I leverage these things? Right, right. Okay. okay. What's, what's, next, what's the next, next question? question? But I mean, I did try all the things. Go ahead. Yeah, next question we got here is uh, from Robert Robert Mitrosak. I can say that pronou pronounce that properly. Um, how are providers keeping up with mobile bandwidth requirements, both urban and rural, of these new tools? There are intensive devices. These are intensive devices in terms of their demands, and I suspect that there are current and future gaps in the coverage, uh, delays in downloading, etc. Yeah. Uh... Obviously, the applications uh, need to be well tested. There's a lot of great tools to be in. Uh, it's just at the AT&T Hackathon, and they have great tools to really test your applications. And a lot of applications do a lot of unnecessary things uh, in communicating back and forth. And uh, so, so one way to do that is to make sure that you're you're testing. But you need to plan need to plan for the gaps. I've always said this all throughout my whole career. Just because you have wireless doesn't mean you're always connected and you have to be able to create applications that will cache or hold information temporarily until you can get back into a sinking speed somewhere. Uh, that is one of, certainly one of the drawbacks you have uh, in areas that are rural and all. And I mentioned uh, you know things that are happening where they're creating almost uh, you know umbrella environments and in distant areas where they're putting balloons up or flying drones actually to create a wireless network uh, in in certain areas. So I, I think you're going to see more efforts like that. And uh, you have to plan your applications to work, not for the fastest, but for the slowest of, the, of them all. Sure, sure. Thank you, Fran, for that one. Uh, the next one I've got here is, is more of a comment, I think, than, than anything else. Kevin from Andreas Wolf. Um, tablets team with larger displays in fixed stations in the field. Well, I've seen a few of those uh, recently. We had a, I think we had a demonstration earlier in the year that uh, Todd Sutton from Zachary put together. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that's, um, that's proving quite its worth um, in, in, in various situations. The next 
question I've got here, again, is more of a comment, again, from Robert Mitrasak. Um, the reason bigger is better for tablets is that construction drawings are typically 36 by 48. Moreover, mobile devices are not such so agile to see the whole drawing or flip between sections of the page. Therefore, it's difficult to see the whole plan on one small device screen. Um, thank, yeah. Thanks, Robert, for that. Uh, Fran, is there anything you want to say on that one? No, no, I, I agree, and and your mileage depends. If you really need to have you know full full drawings, uh, and many many do, but there are many applications that just having small drawings that you can quickly zoom up, pinch up, pinch down. Uh, you know, uh, maybe not on a phone, but I think you know the phablets uh, space, the mini space. You you got enough real estate to do that there, and the trade off is just. The weight and the ability to carry it. I mean, the the mini ones you can almost put in big pockets uh, and carry around. Um, so that's that's your your trade off, uh, and, and I understand that. Yeah, you have to look at each of the applications. Yeah, no, I've no more questions here. Has anybody else got anything else? But uh, I'll say thanks very much to the uh, individuals that raised questions and made comments on that, and thanks, Fran, for for. Uh, yeah. responses on that one. It's my pleasure. Okay. Um, so I'll just move on to the next um, the next slide. Uh, talk about the upcoming mobile IT community sessions. Um, we hold them the third Wednesday of each month. Our next one is the 18th of February. So please save the date for that one. Um, the other thing I need to tell you about as well is the um, Fiat Tech Annual Tech Conference and Showcase, which is April 13th through 16th. Um, and in particular, we're having a pre-conference session on mobile IT. Uh, the community will sit and we will discuss a number of topics. So if you're up for more and uh, can make it along to the conference, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, lots of great things there besides the uh, community as well. Um, okay, moving on to the next slide. So continuing the conversation, we've got uh, social media. Join the community on LinkedIn. For all announcements and follow-ups, uh, we upload the recordings, as most of you know. I've seen a lot of downloads for the community of interest uh, through YouTube. Um, the, the Follow Fear Tech and Comet through Twitter and Facebook. More news about our work, get in touch. Um, we do our follow-up survey. Please, um, please have a look at that because we, we've managed to shape what we do in this community through the comments, observations and suggestions that people have made. Um, and, and, and to look and deliver what people are pretty much looking for uh, and, and you know believe the direction the industry is going. So please do make your comments on that. Uh, without further ado, I'll say thanks very much to Fran um, for, for the presentation. Thanks to Fernando and thanks to everybody else for, for joining us today. Very much appreciated. We had a, a large number turn up today, which is great. Um, we hope everybody's got a lot from it. Um, take it back to the workplace, share it with your colleagues, and uh, we'll see you all in the next um, on the next session. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.